Like, like if I forget what I wanted to say, yeah. I call it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your help. Yes. Yeah. Si. Mm. Yes. 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 We had the proposal to have a poem from Nima, but we don't know if this audience will handle that. Poem. I am very much in favor of, 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 of a slightly different formats at different really? German conferences. <laughs> so, how do you feel about doing that? About doing to start or to finish? Uh, what do you think? At the end, we will have more people. No, I know. Oh, well. But we can yeah, but <coughs> start with a mystica. Exactly. Start so with a mystica. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Something yeah. like that. Yeah. No, no, because yeah. you know, this is all about. Yeah, basically, basically, in a way, somebody said that this conference is like the degrowth movement speed dating other movements. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we like, we show up. What it was we, actually a conference. What, what we bring to the table. Yeah. Okay. So, let's wait. Basically, the, the, the German the German uh, uh, routine is to do it at like there's the, what we call the academic quarter. Okay. So like uh, three four minutes. Some whiskey. Oh God, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be great. Jenny Jaffe, beer from Belgium and Serbia. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got it. <coughs> it's better for time precious. Mm -hmm. It's for time precious. You tell me yourself? Ah, se escucha todo. Pericoso. Entonces la gente sabe lo que estamos hablando. Sí. Va a ser una sorpresa. Estamos ahí con las Ya no sé. Maybe to keep people who are before coming up and do the point. And then after that, you can start the meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. That would help to... Wait. But maybe I'll do it from there. No, I can do it from here. Yeah, I can do it. I'll sit down and do it. Oh, and um, did... did um, is it better to stand up? I mean, I'll tell you that. Do I'll tell you that now. Basically, it's to the moderators to ask the, okay. the, the audience It's more to inviting help if I stand. For like, no, put in a few no. hours of help. <coughs> and there is a helper's coordination. Just... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think I could stand. You want to tap it when you want to do that? Or, you can stand. Or I just go? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Do you want me? I can say. We more will start with our mystic for the time of this Yeah. I think that's better. Start with a mystic. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I don't answer. Okay. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lida Fernanda Forero. I'm from the Transnational Institute. Uh, and we are here for the panel on climate justice and the growth. And we would like to start with uh, something that is let's say traditional for the movements on climate justice, which is a mystica. And uh, it normally it's done by indigenous peoples or by our friends from Via Campesina. And today Nemo will um, 
Say a poem for us. Is that okay? Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. Don't be scared. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Good afternoon, in-laws and outlaws. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to do a poem, and it's going to require that you participate. It's a, a, a call and response kind of poem. So when I say we thought it was oil, you all would say, but it was blood. Is that okay? We thought it was oil. We thought it was oil. But it was blood. Okay, now you can do more than that. Besides just saying this, you have to clap your hands. <laughs> we thought it was all. We thought it was all. The other day, we danced in the street. Joy in our hearts, we thought we were free. Three young folks fell to our right. Countless more fell to our left. Looking up, far from the crowd. We he had red hot guns. We thought it was all. We thought it was all. Had jumping into our mouths, floating on emotion dry wells. We left in fury, but it wasn't funny. Then we beheld bright red pools. We thought it was all. We thought it was all. First the ogonies, today the jaws. Who will be killed this next day? We see open mouths, but we hear no screams. Tell them flow where you are scarred. We stand in pools up to our knees. We thought it was all. We thought it was all. Drive to your bags, polluted streams. Things are real when found in dreams. We see their shells because they are shell. Evil, horrible, dollars called rigs, drilling our souls. We thought it was all terrorist life. We thought it was all terrorist life. Toasted dreams in a scrambled sky. In a burnt million black holes, a burnt ice sky. They are packed with a bus, but our dreams will not bust. We thought it was all terrorist life. We thought it was all terrorist life. They may kill all, but the blood will speak. They may gain all. But the soil will rise. We may die and yet stay alive. Placed on the slab, slaughtered by the day, we are the living, long sacrificed. We thought it was all, but it was blood. We thought it was all, but it was blood. Lord of oil companies. Thank you, Nimo. Uh, well, we will start. We will have three first inputs, uh, 15 minutes each, <coughs> on the perspective on the climate justice movement and uh, which are the commonalities with the growth debate. Uh, how can we find alternatives within the uh, climate justice discussions and debates, and which are the next steps? This is the main. Uh, a point that we have asked the three of the of the speakers to answer through their inputs and just to start this debate has been presented yesterday by Naomi Klein by Nicola Bullard by Alberto and we think this is one of the critical issues now uh, with the crisis that we are facing we see this as a civil civilizatory crisis and part of this, the climate crisis is, is an important um, dimension. Uh, through the last years, let's say 20 years, maybe more, the climate justice movement has been growing and has facing, faced different moments and challenges. Uh, we see as a, as a next moment the, the COP21 in Paris next year, but there are this year other moments like the COP20 in Lima uh, and beyond those moments of the negotiations at the United Nations level, there is the discussion uh, among the movements on how can we resist and how can we build alternatives. So that's what we want to listen today from our friends. 
And I will give the floor initially to Tachio Mueller. He has been part of the climate justice movements also for many years and now is with the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Germany. Thank you very much. And um, thank you very much, Nemo, for that excellent mystica. Um, so if the question is, um, what are the commonalities between the climate justice movement and the degrowth movement, such as it is, um, I kind of feel a bit like this conference is the degrowth movement speed dating other movements, just kind of trying to work out, okay, you know, what do we have in common, you and the older globalization movement and the climate justice movement? And so as to uh, create the potential to make this into a longer lasting relationship rather than just a movement one night stand, um, I figured I'd start on a bit of a note of discord rather than emphasizing the commonalities like a shared tendency, shared tendency to critique capitalism, a critique of overproduction, overconsumption, um, I wanted to first emphasize some, what I consider some significant differences between the degrowth movement and uh, the climate justice movement, not to revel in these differences and say we are so different we can't work together, but just to clarify them so that we have a clearer sense of the possibilities of cooperation. So, <clears throat> The first significant difference that I would see between degrowth on the one hand and climate justice on the other is that degrowth is a story that is largely articulated by folks in the global north. It's a story that speaks from sensibilities that exist in the north and to sensibilities that exist in the north. For example, the um, growth critic, the German growth critic Nico Pech, who's been mentioned here a few times, in one of his texts, speaks of, quote, trying to protect oneself against a veritable deluge of consumption opportunities. Now, that is not a problem that the majority of people in the global south actually face. Their problem is not how not to consume so much, right? That is definitely a problem that comes from surplus societies. So if degrowth and most of the degrowth authors are based in the global north, we can sort of see that. If degrowth is based in the global north, climate justice, on the other hand, is a story articulated by, or maybe better, a movement led by folks from the global south. Um, I'll come in a second to the emergence of climate justice, but the whole point about climate justice is, in fact, the south, which can also be in the north, say, indigenous movements in the US, um, articulating, taking a strong political stance and articulating demands against and on the north. In very short, the history of climate justice, I'll try to summarize it and probably do a bit of violence to it. Um, when the environmental movement emerged in the United States in the 1960s, it was very much a movement of white people for white people. Say, if, the, if there was folks in a middle class community struggling against a dirty power plant, the, the, the demand tended to be just get this power plant out of our communities. The term NIMBYism, not in my backyard, kind of comes from there. It's like, just, I, I, we don't want this dirty power plant here. Now, of course, that dirty power plant wasn't shut down. It was displaced geographically and socially into poorer communities, often communities of color. And against this tendency of the environmental movement to be a movement by and for white people and middle class people, the environmental justice movement arose in communities of color that said, look, folks, what you're engaging in is not so much environmentalism, you're engaging in environmental racism. You're not solving environmental problems, you're merely displacing them onto poorer and usually more dark-skinned people. So environmental justice arises as a critique of environmental racism. And climate justice, a term first articulated by an American indigenous leader, Tom Goldtooth, in the mid-90s, arises as, in a way, a challenge to what might be called a global climate racism, where the full solutions peddled within the uh, UN climate change negotiations don't, in fact, solve the climate problem, but, in fact, displace it onto folks who are further south, poorer, and often darker skinned. So, from this distinction between the, the, the degrowth movement being located in and coming from the global north and climate justice coming from the south, we can also see that there is actually a danger inherent in the degrowth discourse, which is in a way the danger of a new global environmental racism. Just to be clear, I'm not accusing the degrowth movement of engaging in environmental racism. I'm pointing to a potential danger, say, a demand 
that would sound like, boy, everybody in the world has to stop growing, and that includes you folks in the South. Or um, a new environmental classism. Or you poor people in the North and the South, we all need to tighten our belts. And, um, uh, you know, obviously we know what happens when we all have to tighten our belts. It's never everybody who tightens their belts. So my point is that degrowth, realizing that it comes from the North, has to take the global justice dimension into account a lot more, which also means getting out of its two favorite, favorite aggregate states. The degrowth movement seems to exist on the one hand as a sort of scientific middle-class media story, and on the other hand, a set of interesting, if largely niche or marginal social practices of degrowth. So what's kind of missing is the middle level, the terms of the, the, the middle level of strategy, of struggles and demands, and of the question of how can we actually have global effects. Now, the second question, rather the second difference I wanted to emphasize, is that climate justice, unlike degrowth, is rooted in specific struggles. It is rooted in the struggles of frontline communities fighting against resource extraction, um, fighting against mega projects. It is uh, located in the struggle of small farmers fighting against agribusiness. And um, by being rooted in a particular set of struggles, it also identifies an agent of change, namely frontline communities and their allies. Now, even if the climate justice discourse or movement which identifies this agent of change, even if our analysis is, it could very well be wrong, maybe those frontline communities aren't the agent of change or don't actually have the capacity to change things, the degrowth movement, if it is a movement, uh, suffers, I think, from the fact that it does not identify an agent of change. It doesn't actually identify who has the interest and the capacity to change the existing state of affairs. Who's actually interested, or, or, uh, you know, in terms of a mass base? in shutting off this growth dynamic. And uh, so that's kind of, I would say, uh, so, you know, if I say the first difference is degrowth is in the north, climate justice comes from the south. Climate justice identifies an agent of change and is rooted in specific struggles. Degrowth is really more a story and a discourse. But there's also a third difference. So right, right now, I'm just kind of glorifying the climate justice movement. And it's not as though you know, we're winning all our big battles. So I, please don't, I, I don't want to make this seem like we're speaking from a position of, hey, we know everything, and please listen to us. Because there's a third difference, and I think that one comes out very much in favor of the degrowth movement or story, namely that it is a frame or a story that resonates in Europe and the global north. The climate justice frame generally does not resonate very much in the global north at all. We've been trying that for several years in Germany to implement you know, a movement or to create a movement around climate justice, and we've failed. There are 3,000 people at this conference. I'm apparently not in this room right now, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm told, I've been told there are 3,000 people here. Now, sorry, they're on live stream. Hi, everybody. Hi, hi, hi you live stream people. Now, um, if we had tried to organize a conference on climate justice and called it, 17th International Conference for Climate Justice, we would never ever have gotten 3,000 people. It simply would not have happened, right? So our climate justice frame doesn't really resonate in the North. And that, in terms of the back to the speed dating approach, you know, I think this is what the two potential partners bring to the table. Climate justice brings an actual movement, actual struggles, identifies an agent of change, and is self-led, so, 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 so really internalizes the global justice dimension. Um, and the degrowth movement has something very important, which is a frame that resonates. Because without a resonating frame, movements are just disparate elements and struggles. So, um, having now identified what's actually interesting in terms of us coming together here, I'm just going to point to one particular area of agreement where I think the efforts of degrowth folks and of the climate justice movement might coincide in sort of the coming years in Germany, in Europe, and beyond. And that is something that we all have in common, and that is a struggle against the fossil fuel industry. Now, the degrowth folks know very well that the madness of industrial capitalist growth over the last 250 years has been powered by and wouldn't have been possible without fossil fuels. They're essential in the growth machine that fucks everything up. Now, from the climate justice set, we know that not only are fossil fuels one of the key sources of climate change, 
this energy sector is also one of the key points of strategic leverage where we have to apply our forces to affect change that is global. And I think in the last two to three minutes, I just want to say something about the mobilizations we're planning first in Germany and then in Par towards Paris in 2015. And I'm saying the following because we from the climate or climate justice movements in Germany, we have not had a major disobedient climate action that has packed more than three or 400 people in the last seven years. Our last major disobedient climate action was the climate and anti-racist camp in Hamburg, where in 2008 we were 700 people at our main action. If it hadn't rained for 36 hours non-stop, it would have been a few hundred more, but the numbers weren't particularly exciting, especially given that in anti-fascist actions in Dresden we can get five, 10,000 people, 12,000 people, Kastor Schottern, 4,000 people. Like, 700 isn't that many. Next year, there'll be a climate camp in July or August in the uh, Western German lignite mining region. Naomi Klein mentioned it yesterday. Now, in the organizing process, folks have said, we actually want to do an action where there's at least a thousand people, a disobedient action that tries to shut down what is one of, what is one of Europe's CO2 hotspots, which houses two of Europe's three dirtiest coal-fired power plants, and which makes Germany the leading exporter of lignite worldwide, which lignite, as you may know, is brown coal, is the single dirtiest of all the fossil fuels. And now we're going to try and shut that down. However, we might need you. If there's 3,000 people here, and only, and, and obviously on the live stream, um, if only a third of those people join us at the climate camp and start to take disobedient action, we could do a lot more than we've been able to do the last few years. And that mobilization isn't just going to be the end of mobilization. In fact, what's going to happen is that the climate justice movement is developing a sort of, is developing strategies how to fight the fossil fuel sector, how to fight um, the corporate climate criminals that we know aren't going to be punished within the UN climate change negotiations. So, I suppose, as a sort of first dating project, you know, rather than jumping straight in, but let's say, let's go on a few dates. Let's say, for example, the next date would be summer of 2015, in the Western German lignite mining region. Let's do something together. Maybe we'll all see each other at a second date in Paris in November and December of next year. Because in spite of the differences I identified at the beginning, the commonalities are significant. Without degrowth in the north, there cannot be global climate justice. We need each other. Let's work more on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. You were strict on time. Uh, so now, after this call to the northern um, perspective of the growth, we will have two speakers from the south, as myself, I'm also from the south. Uh, but we wanted to bring this debate, this conversation here, and have it with, with you. Um, so, Nemo Basi from Nigeria, he is part of Friends of the Earth, he is part of Oil Watch and Homef. Uh, yeah, I think his name speaks by himself. So. Thank you, Lida. Good afternoon. Yeah, I know you. You don't like you don't like just to respond, you don't like to respond many to many times at many conferences. <laughs> yeah, I keep on trying. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you, Tadjo, for that uh, opening. Uh, you've said it, you said a lot of, you laid the foundation for this conversation. And um, as you said, really, okay, personally, when I hear the word the growth, it raises a lot of alarms in my head uh, in many directions because I, whenever I hear the, hear the word the growth, I, I ask myself, what does this really mean? Who is degrowing and from what? Why degrowth? But I know there's been a lot of books, papers written on this topic, so, uh, and I don't want to go into disputing what, that, what has been written and the options and the various connotations. But it must be said that the critical, to me, the critical, requirement for the growth, besides all the analysis, is 
for everyone, especially in the consuming regions, to consider creating or campaigning for and making it happen for a kind of re relinking with nature. What has harmed the planet and what is pushing the planet to limits is because humanity has distanced itself from the basis of life. And then we can justify it. For one, technology can fix every, anything. If the climate goes bust, well, you can have geoengineering. If trees or crops are not growing, you have genetic engineering. There's always a technological solution to every problem, but this is all false. And so the struggle, the, the struggle between climate justice, the distance between this and the growth that must be bridged, is it's going to be it's going to happen at the crime scenes. Every mine pit, every coal mine is a crime scene. Every oil field is a crime scene. And we know the criminals. Over the years, there have been so many negotiations about, on climate change, the conference of parties or conference of polluters, as, uh, <laughs> as our friends like to call them. Uh, so they keep meeting and talking. They, everyone knows what is pushing global warming, but nobody says anything about what's to be done to stop it. Even the World Bank says that we just have to open up, we have to stop opening new oil fields, new fossil fuel fields. The International Energy Agency says the same thing. But when it's time to negotiate global warming, everybody just ignores that because corporations are in the driving seat. As long as corporations call the shots on planet Earth, the growth will not happen. So that's a major point of convergence between the climate justice movement and the degrowth campaigns and conversations. It's an assignment that we cannot escape. If there's going to be a future for plan this planet, if we're not all going to migrate to Mars or somewhere, then the power of corporations must be curtailed, if not completely dismantled. The moment I watched the story of stuff, I don't know how many of you have seen it. There's one in that short uh, movie, documentary, it's a clip that stuck to my memory, and I, when I think about it, I know, I know this is the problem we're having. It's a place that shows a gov government shining the shoes of a co corporation. So our governments are shoe shine boys for corporations. Governments in the south, governments in the north, they all dance into the same beat. As long as policymakers depend on impulses and signals from corporations, then, of course, the paradigm, the, the, the methods, the production and consumption will continue to go in that dimension. And then, of course, this morning I was in the Degrowth and History uh, panel listening to excellent presentations. And again, it echoed in my mind that, you know, when governments and consuming entities get into a bind, when they create probably dig a hole they can't get out of, they find a new statistical myth to cover up the mess. And that's why you have crime being added as a national product to up the GDP. I mean, if drugs, I mean, drug deals can, can be counted as something positive, then I think that again, that, that shows clearly that we have clearly lost it. Now, there's, there's one other example that was given, but I don't want to mention it. Because you all look like very holy people. <laughs> okay, you're not holy people? Okay, I mentioned it. <laughs> I know sex, sex work. 
the sex workers, right? And it's legitimate jobs to do. But when nations begin to scratch around for what to add to their national productivity, so as to build up GDP, then something is wrong. <laughs> you all are looking so <laughs> you are looking so serious. You make me feel bad. <laughs> now, anyway, now the point I'm making is that we cannot always find make excuses for inaction or for destructive activities. <clears throat> Growth has been powered by plunder. And this plunder is historical and it's continued today. One of the best cartoons I've seen in the recent time was drawn by Polycarp, a new internationalist, and he had the map of the world, and Africa has been excavated and all the things discovered from Africa heaped in Europe and North America. But I, th I think that was, that, that was a very apt way to capture the plunder of the continent. But it's also a metaphor for the plunder of nature across the world. Not just in Africa, but in Europe, in North America, especially in the, in the tar sand fields of Canada and of course in the veins of the mineral rich regions of Latin America. So growth has been powered by the myth that we can always grab whatever we want. And if it gets really desperate, we can move somewhere else. And we've got examples of so many displacements going on in the world to make room for growth. But this cannot, certainly cannot go on forever. It's got to stop. And this is, this is a major reason why, besides making nice philosophical uh, speeches or declarations, we have to roll our sleeves and get down to the streets and force the argument so that real actions are taken to confront real problems. The challenges of plunder echo in people's lives. And I've seen very clearly climate justice fights on the ground that are successful. I'll give you one example. The people of Ogoni were able to expel shell from their territory in 1993. Now, they did not call it climate justice fight then. But when we look back and see what has, Ogoni is a place in Nigeria anyway, in the oil fields of Nigeria, where we had a legendary environmental justice campaigner who was killed 19, 19 years ago at the pleasure of Shell and the military government in Nigeria then. But the blood sown in the struggle has powered resistance till date. So much so that no one has been able to open up the oil field since 1993 in Ogoni territory. This is the kind of struggle we want to see replicated in Yasuni. And of course, I think in Lofoten in Norway is largely successful to date, keeping the oil rigs away from Lofoten, offshore Lofoten. And we need, to, we need to see this happening around the world in more places. And sad to say that the more we campaign against extraction of crude oil, the more new oil fields are found. And they are found in fragile ecosystems. And, and so if the need for fossil fuels continues unchecked. We're going to destroy, beyond what has been destroyed now, the very last dregs of places, the last points that we have around the, on the planet where life could be rebuilt or once, once more from the destruction. What does this mean? It means it's far more urgent, more urgent than we think the issue of keeping oil in the ground, keeping coal in the ground, is more urgent than it ever was. The transition from fossil fuel-driven energy and power source is more urgent today than it was yesterday. The immediate stopping of ext extreme extractivism, including fracking, and I hear that moves to frack somewhere between Germany and Switzerland and 
in Le Constance, something around there? I, I thought it was more in the north, but yes, yeah. there's plenty of fracking yeah. lands going on. And some people are moving more to the Arctic region. Yeah. Of course, you know, there's a flag already at the North Pole. So all these moves are clearly uh, unacceptable. But there, there's, there are ways we can join the movements and the campaigns and the struggles to bring about a more rapid solution. One is for us to collectively say yes to life. If you say yes to life, then you have to find out what are the things we are saying no to. And one of the things we have to say no to is mining. You say yes to life, you say no to mining. And somebody asked me, well, how are you going to cope if you mine? Are you going to produce all this, all of all the technology that we need? How are you going to do it if you stop mining? But we have to ask ourselves, have we not mined enough? Many of the things that have been mined are wasted, and some are just kept in vaults in the guys that they have value. All the gold has been locked up. What's the value of the gold? Artificial value placed by economists or by politicians. Or the degree of the destruction, the lives lost, the pollution, destruction of the environment, the things we've lost that cannot be replaced, we cannot factor that as part of the progress that we've made. These are source on the on the history of mankind. What I'm saying is that in both the climate justice movement and the growth movement, we have to tackle the issue of addiction. I know withdrawal can be difficult, but then anybody who wants to recover has to face that situation. And so we have to say this is nice, but we can't go that way. Very clearly. Ecological collapse is real. Most species are going extinct, and the more climate changes, the more this will happen. The more we accumulate, start to accumulate, the more this would happen. And there just has to be a point where we say enough is enough. It's very difficult to say enough is enough, but it has to be said. From what I've heard in the corridors of this conference and from what I read about the degrowth movement, the arguments and the, the explanations, it's clear that the time has come for us all to go back to the beginning, to ask very basic questions. The most profound answers to the problems we have are found in very simple issues. I think this is what the growth, to me, that's what the, the direction of the growth. And the growth would happen anyway, inevitably. The question is to make it happen in an organized way. If anybody said there would no need for the growth, in the consuming mode especially, and of course I don't approve of catch the catch-up syndrome. He said, okay, I need to catch up with somebody else because this is what they did. I don't think the right way to go, because, but the real thing for us is to ask, what is life? What is a good life? Why are we on this planet? What can we do with the time that we have here? How can we live in such a way that we say, well, we are actually alive? When we consume, is that what makes our identity? Well, I, I, think, I think I'm preaching to the converted, so. <laughs> but you know, one of the things that really, really gets me very angry is when I hear, you know, in, in my everyday work, as I work with NGOs who talk about sustainability. They talk about corporate social responsibility. And I think these are very beautiful oxymorons because there's no extractive sector corporation that can be responsible the best social responsibility of these corporations is to stop extracting. As long as they keep extracting, they're absolutely irresponsible. And they're applauded, applauded by politicians because they help to build up the GDP. Am I right? 
You don't know whether I'm right or not. Right. <laughs> totally. That is my fault. I'm always right. <laughs> no, you always expect an answer. <laughs> okay. So um, I'm going to I'm going to halt for for the time being. But what I'm saying that the catch, catch up syndrome cannot be justified because it only intensifies climate irresponsibility. And if we determine if peoples around the world critically ask themselves what is life and what is living, where do I want to go from here, where am I coming from, I believe that we're going to find ways of living in a way that is responsible, a way that is within limits, a way that can genuinely say we are living something for the future. Because come to think of it, as a last thought, and I hang up uh, for the moment, come to think of all the extraction that has gone on in the world today. The extractive activities are not about things that are not renewable. When you take gold out of the ground, you don't put back gold. When you take crude oil from the ground, you don't put back crude oil. And yet you say you are, you are carrying on this activity with the future in mind. If that statement is true, there's no better definition for madness. Because when you take what you cannot put back, you are, com you are completely depleting the future and making it impossible for people in the future to have access to what you've done. So again, the actions, the point of intersection between the growth and climate justice must be at the scene where crime is committed and that is on the ground. It would not be in, the co in conference halls, it would not be in the halls where multilateral uh, agreements are being negotiated. It has to be a complete focus on points wherever manifestations of violence occur. And violence can be equated to overconsumption. Because when you, when you consume too much, you're actually wrecking violence on the planet. And then, of course, we have to demand a stop to the kind of violent destruction that we're seeing around the world. I'm talking about war, I'm talking about insurgency, I'm talking about the military industrial complex. Uh, they, they are both impacting the climate, by the amount of fossil fuels they use to move all those tanks and warships and everything. And then, of course, the, the, the material required just for destruction. I've heard about a seminar by the U.S. Army, the U.S. military. They had a conference on environmentally friendly warfare. If you believe that, that is possible then I think I, I would like to hear about that. So the, the thing is that rather than stop destruction, more and more reasons are being found to destroy more. And so let me just end with this. We have to say, whether in the climate just movement, in the growth movement, wherever we are as activists and peoples, stop wars. It's time to fight climate change. We must stop fighting our peoples and fighting one another. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nimo. Um, now, Lucia from Brazil, Lucia Ortiz, she's from Brazil, International Coordinator of the Economic Justice Program of Friends of the Earth. Uh, we'll continue the discussion from the South, um, bringing a perspective from Latin America. Muchas gracias, Lita. Thank you very much, and good afternoon to all of you. I will now talk in Spanish or Portuguese Spanish. I'm very honored to be here today. Can you hear me? Okay, fine. Tatsu started to talk about the origins of the movement of climate justice. And I would also like to talk about that a little bit. And also about the situation of climate justice in order to then have a look at the process that is going on and in order to 
exercise some critique on our own movement and to talk about how we can form alliances. Here it is also, of course, about the degrowth movement. And finally, I would also like to talk about how we want to continue our actions in the climate justice movement. I would like to start by saying that the climate justice movement from the basis is against climate change, of course. Early on, we noticed that also those countries who do not have the historical responsibility, so that means minorities or poorer countries, who are the countries that are most affected by climate change, have also must also be included. And we also have to have a look at their development and how they can adjust. But we also have to look at the perspective of the victims of climate change and how they can adjust themselves and their culture. For example, production of food. And how these people can then leave their role as a victim and become the drivers of change. The, all the false solutions that have been taken in order to stop climate change have also a very serious effect on especially those people who are not responsible for it. The people in the communities of the South who are victims of the multinational companies who are victims of the false solutions against climate change. They are victims of monoculture or of the expansion of big energy companies. There are also problems when we talk about flexibility, transformation, into the direction of the South, clean development. We had some first experience with uh, CO2 emissions, um, sorry, CO2 emissions trade. Our movement has always taken care of of uh, using fossil fuels in a different way. Um, sorry, there is a technical problem with uh, the sound of the interpretation. Coal in the hole, the tar sands in the land. Cosas que no combinan tanto en español. The interpretation team is very sorry, English interpretation will come back soon. There is a technical problem. Lock the gate. Venir las otras formas no convencionales. So we now have to find new non-conventional ways in order to lead our struggles. And uh, we had things that were necessary uh, before and we cannot uh, just uh, um, blame everything on coal, on brown coal. We have to demystify our struggles. Another question is the question about climate. 
that we often have like an umbrella above all. which is exacerbating the problems that we all already have due to extractivism. This is one reason for our resistance. They are all linked together. In 2009 in Copenhagen, it was the first time that, uh, or it was a very important moment when we called on the people to start a change and we were people who already knew each other we were from the anti-globalization movement we were not only environmentalists but we were climate experts in Cochabamba we also called upon the governments and the populations Um, to use the investments uh, that are used for uh, military for something else, for example, the struggle against climate change. Oh, we also resisted against the new wave of the expansion of emissions trading. And now the struggle against extractivism has become a common struggle. And at the same time, th we saw that the negotiations did not have concrete answers about the limitations of, um, of our planet. And we also warned the people that the companies have actually a great influence on the governments. And then there's, there are many more problems like free trade negotiations or free trade agreements. And all these are having an impact on the sovereignty of states and people. And we can see our activism as a way to gain a decoupling. So the influence of companies on the United Nations have to be stopped. But not only this, not only the false solutions against climate change, but we rather also have to find real solutions against extractivism and against the financial markets and the financing of the United Nations. We have a discordance here. We already talked about it yesterday with Naomi Klein that often in the capitalism, the real solutions are not valid and we cannot deepen our models. When we reflected on that, after the financial crisis, we saw that our common system, so growth and CO2 emissions, at that time it looked very attractive. So since then, uh, they were looking for an alternative in green growth. which meant that that the territories where we extracted the fuel uh, fossil fuels was exploited and we had to pay for this exploitation i think it is fair to say that today there is a right for companies to cut down trees to exploit resources 
when afterwards the companies pay for what they did. It was easier for us then to create links against this financialization of nature. And the pro to use the propaganda of a green economy, which has also led to other mechanisms, for example, sustainable development and other innovations of green development and biodiversity. For example, the smart agriculture, which is uh, which was invented by Ban Ki Moon, but of course uh, he was talking about uh, monoculture and genetical engineering. The struggle against the financialization of nature is only a struggle led by us, the alternative movement. Is that the resistance is only led by us. And we are trying to find alternative ways to use these territories with these new possibilities of financing that still bear the same risks, of course. And this is how we deconnect from nature. And we continue to do so. But of course, we do that on the backs of uh, the people who live in these territories, at their cost. But we still have to find alternative solutions and to expand our alternative system on an international level we have to lead a fight is this anti-xenophobe, anti-patriarchalic, and which is against extractivism and also against growth. So we can say it is a struggle against development. So actually we have to say no, clearly no. But at the same time we have to open the door to many, yes, we have to say yes to many things. This is the fruit of a long struggle. For example, the peasant agriculture. And also food sovereignty are very important points here in helping to reduce the heating of our planet. This also leads to the fact that indigenous people can live in harmony with nature and traditional communities and that they have the right to do so. We also want to have um, common rights to use uh, water and forests in those territories. It is possible to have a just change, which uh, was driven by the social class struggles and the labor movement. In this process, we have various proposals. And here we have an intersection, of course, of our both, both our movements, degrowth and climate justice movement. I was a little bit afraid, to be honest. that we find a narrative here that is very Eurocentristic. Mm. 
And now that I'm here, yesterday I saw that actually we share a lot of our principles. We are really connected. Uh, even if we come from from different concepts, from good life, from different movements, different cultures, we all share these principles. Localization of economy, solidarity, cooperation, and no competition. And this all can be seen in our movements. And in the fact that we are having a dialogue and trying to get inspired by the others. And now I, I think we can maybe make a call for uh, for common struggles and uh, common movement. At the last Polutus conference in Warsaw, was a mo conference where at the end we as a movement we went away and we left those co um, companies alone in their dialogue. Afterwards we had a call in Venezuela which also needed um, international solidarity because of the situation there and we called upon to organize a conference there in order to limit the power of companies and to have a look at the possibilities to collaborate and to act together. We also had um, the event of Ban Ki-moon about climate and agriculture and so forth. Uh, we talked about South against North. And we need to ask ourselves questions in order to find a real transition. When we talk about Paris 2015, there will be negotiations about a text, uh, about a new text, and we will also want to lead some struggles and do some actions with the vision of 2020. But I would like to ask you to come to Paris and to see what the negotiations are going on there. Um, the negotiations about the text in Paris. And also to see how the near liberalism of climate can be a major threat to humanity. We have to mobilize people. We have to share our messages, messages about resistance against extractivism with the goal to stop the financialization of nature and the destruction of nature and we have to find solutions without the corporations. Thank you. Well, thanks to, to you, our speakers. Um, when we were preparing the, the panel and the inputs, we said we would prefer to have a debate with, with the people here because we are trying to create like an exchange on how do we see the process that we have followed in the demands for climate justice, environmental justice, social justice. And and it's it's pretty much linked with the with the degrowth debate. We were seeing different perspectives of of that. Tacho was trying to say there are differences which are mainly spaces to, to come together. So we would like to open the floor for you, not only to make questions, but also comments to debate with the ideas you just heard. And then we can come back to the, to the panel. So we would like to make an intervention.
Um, thank you very much um, to all of you. Um, I'm really glad that we have this discussion and this date um, today. Um, and I just wanted to respond to basically to touch us a call for um, talking about next year um, and um, tell everybody that also in the degrowth debate, we have been discussing basically the same questions. And um, so there's a lot of um, like, uh, we're very open to this debate. Um, and some of us have already gone to the climate camp this year. And um, we have already experimented with very interesting possibilities to do actions there um, in the coal mines. Um, and I think there's a lot of potential to bring these two discourses and movements together and create something that is um, very, very interesting and inspiring. Um, and I really hope that we will um, develop something out of this. Thank you very much. Well, in the same spirit, I think that in this conference we've seen yesterday Alberto Acosta speaking not only once, twice in the first plenary, from very much from the south and very close to Acción Ecológica. And today we had in the morning somebody from Greece talking about late nights school in Greece, and Greece being like the south in Europe in many senses. And the first thing that one should start by saying the growth is one thing, and the global environmental justice movement, including climate justice, is, is very different. I think the global environmental justice movement is much bigger in the world, actually and especially potentially, and the growth is relatively small, and the origin is clearly European, isn't it? Uh, with the steady state, a little bit US. But uh, so the growth should be like an ally of the global environment. And, and moving to concrete issues, for instance, in Peru, there is oil exploitation, and in Amazonian territory, just next to Ecuador, and there is the Ashwar people, they have been really screwed up by oxy for many years. This is very well known by now that they have cadmium in the blood, even the government recognizes this. So we have very good reasons to leave oil in the soil everywhere, including the Amazonia of, of Peru. And many people would be ready to support this from the growth or from the environmental. And also, apart from going, as many people, you have convinced many people here, including myself, to go to Cologne, to the Rhine, and to, to this camping place against Lignet. Also, I think we could choose a few places in Europe, either shell gas or lignites, in which the local situation would be, for instance, in the Canary Islands, which is official in Europe because it belongs to Spain. There is now a very big uh, debate, and the local people don't want Repsol to start exploiting oil. And the Madrid government is saying, yes, you have to. So there is even a kind of regional debate. The same thing in Mallorca, which is very familiar to German people. Um, so because of oil exploration, so one could choose not just uh, one place, but five, six places to have these common fights for living gas under the grass and, and coal in the hole and so on. So. But I don't see. I thought you started a little bit on the wrong. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about the first speaker, because another commonality is that both movements are not by professors and and writers. They are activist-led, activist-led uh, science or activist-led uh, intellectual production, both environmental justice and and degrowth. So degrowth has no intellectual. Well, we've talked about some leaders, some of them are dead already intellectually, but degrowth would not exist without all these people doing practical things, isn't it? And it's the same thing with environmental justice or political ecology. Talking like a professor, I feel, but I mean. <laughs> Could you say your name so I know which professor you are? <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Thank you for the interesting <laughs> talks. Uh, it's clear that the uh, COP in Paris next year will be a crucial moment. In several places, several countries are here the same. We have to mobilize. Uh, so I think this will uh, really happen. But my question is, uh, how will these networks, most of activists, organize themselves to have their own agenda? To clearly say to the official negotiators, you know, it's okay or it's not okay. So I'm a bit afraid we will, be, we will be there with a lot of people doing a lot of action, but how and where will a kind of common agenda be developed the coming months? Um, yeah, I also have a question. I think it's a really good idea to link these two movements on one hand side climate justice and on the other hand side degrowth because I think they're two, uh, how do you say it in English, two, two parts of the same coin. Because you have growth or like degrowth and that's just the, I would say it's the root cause and climate justice is dealing with the symptom, sim, symptoms, man, what a difficult word. Um, of, of the problem. So linking these two movements together would make the whole thing a bit more efficient. And as a general, I love efficiency. <laughs> no. Um, and um, but, yeah, that's one comment. And I have one question. Um, yeah, there was one initiative uh, in the, in, in the, in the um, as, yeah, there was, there was one question asked as part of the Yasuni, pr Yasuni problem, the national park uh, that was uh, uh, privatized and then they're now, you know, you, you know the problem in Ecuador. Um, and uh, the suggestion was from the uh, Ecuadorian government, as far as I remember, uh, to ask the world that they should pay them so in order not to extract. Do you think this would be, is a good idea and is a good, yeah, is a good idea that should be done again, should it repeat it, or do you think it's not the right strategy? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a question? <laughs> um, even if I, I think this is uh, important to, to be aware of this uh, summits of the polluters and uh, these big events but i think for a long time that a lot of people in these movements have realized how limited it is to act in this to follow the agenda of the people who are screwing you know, the planet up and uh, that you just mentioned about uh, how creating our own agenda and i think that's when if we talk about climate justice and if we are in europe it's really really important to to talk about the people who are resisting daily in there is impressive uh, struggles going on right now. For example, if, it, if, we, if we are calling for people to come for next year in the summer, uh, in 2015 to West Germany, but right now people are squatting the forest uh, in Hamburger Forst and there's going to be action days uh, in one month, so <laughs> in the beginning of October, uh, like in Wadi Souza in Italy, or in Russia Montana, or in Notre Dame de Land in, uh, in France, where in, uh, in these places at the same time we have very clearly what we don't want and what we want. So different uh, like uh, people experimenting the ways we want to live. Um, and there's this network Reclaim the Fields as well uh, in, uh, in Europe trying to connect these struggles. And yeah. Uh, yeah, more, more than following this, the, their agenda, there's this really impressive struggles who are actually winning <laughs> right now and they are really inspiring happening. In, and it's really important to talk about them if we talk about climate justice in Europe. No quotation? Because it's only men uh, talking? Okay. A woman. Shall I? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Filipita, I'm climate activist and scholar and um, you talked a lot about differences of this, uh, this both mov movements, and uh, I want to ask uh, about one commonality. Uh, it's more a weakness. Uh, I think um, 
it's a thesis. If, if we want to step out of our niche uh, of struggles, we have to uh, include uh, trade unions and big parties. Um, firstly, the trade unions in the south and in the north. And um, I've been part of climate justice struggles for the last five, six years, and I think uh, I have been participating in several of these meetings where this uh, deficit has been mentioned, and we never got out of this uh, yeah, point. So um, the question uh, in, so in solidarity with the activities last next year in, in the Rhineland, I think it's really important that we should do that. How do we get a, a, a much bigger step forward uh, to include the trade unions? Are these discussions in your organizations? Are you thinking about how we can be uh, people which will be who will be accepted by the trade unions as a uh, um, someone to talk to? What is uh, your idea about that? Okay. Um, <coughs> I'll um, <coughs> start with the um, last question first regarding trade unions. Um, yes, and so absolutely, yes, we need trade unions involved, and that statement needs to go beyond the merely appellative exhortation to like go and involve trade unions. Because usually the meetings that, like say for example, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation seven years ago did a major conference, so-called CAR conference, the Autokonferenz in Stuttgart, CAR country. Um, and you know, we tried to engage trade unions in talking about conversion projects, and we failed miserably. We keep trying to engage um, uh, trade unions to talk about conversion of the coal industry. We failed miserably. Now, there's a comrade of ours, Jonathan Neal, from the UK, who was involved with creating the One Million Climate Jobs campaign. Great work. That was great. However, I've heard very few trade unions liking to talk about what should be, de like what should be cut down. And, and I was almost going to say downsizing. That's, of course, the other size word. But um, like, it's a real challenge. To get and for very obvious reasons, it's a real challenge to get trade unions to talk about cutting back sectors that are en environmentally destructive. The car industry in Germany, the coal mining industry. Like this is a real challenge. Now I would say what is needed, because the trade unions at this point always say, okay, we need a just transition. A just transition is kind of code for a transition to a uh, you know post-carbon economy that doesn't. Um, just kind of take it from the workers. That doesn't just negatively impact workers, but that also gives them a sort of just way into a new society. Now, I've genuinely said, yes, great, that is a great idea. Let's have just transition ideas. That then leads to the next question. Who is going to propose these plans for a just transition? In terms of trusted interlocutors, it won't be kind of bourgeois eco-academics like myself. Uh, I'm clearly not a trustworthy interlocutor on more levels than you can fathom. And um, it has to be the trade unions, because any plan not coming from the trade unions will be justifiably distrusted by trade unionists. And this is where I now do something that I don't like to do, which is like exhorting people to do something. The unions need to move. They need to propose projects for just transitions. There is no other way. They cannot come from the Social Democratic Party. They can certainly not come from the Left Party or the Green Party. They cannot come from us, the movements. They must come from the trade unions. There is no other actor that can conceivably propose such a plan. So this is my point. Yes, it's very important. But without this next step, just transition plans being proposed by trade unions or trade unionists, we're stuck. And the big fear that I have is 10 years down the line, I mean, you and I are involved in the anti-coal movement, a bunch of people here are. My big fear is that five or 10 years down the line, we'll be fighting hand to hand, and obviously we'll lose, you know, on a sort of hand to hand level. Ecologists versus trade unionists, when we try to shut down a coal mine and they try to keep it open. That's my fear. That cannot happen for a green left or a left ecological agenda. So sorry, I took some time on this. I'll just very briefly speak to two other points. One. You, you spoke to the occupation of Hambacher Forst in the west of Germany. There's folks with, with crazy action skills and mad determination occupying some, an old growth forest, which is going to be cut down for the expansion of the open pit lignite mine. And I seriously have all the respect for this in the world for this struggle. 
But many people don't go and do these constant everyday struggles. They will come to spectacular events. And we need to find a sort of productive interaction between the everyday struggles and the spectacular events. And what I was now talking about was a spectacular event that builds on the many local struggles that are going on there and the great outreach work that is being done. So I didn't want to sort of be silent about those struggles, but say, hey, even those of us who are not involved in this everyday stuff, we need to start focusing on what goes on there. And um, comrade professor will maybe um, have, the, have the conversation later on. There's a great article possibly by you called Environmental Justice and Economic Degrowth and Alliance Between Two Movements, um, which I read in preparation for this. And clearly um, the thought has been around, uh, so I take, I take your points. And what do you do in Paris? I think it's also important to point out that not everybody has to go to Paris, but we just have to see Paris as a step in a process whereby our movements start focusing on the real corporate climate criminals, which is why I like the term crime scenes that you bring into the discussion. Because ultimately we can jump up and down and ask, you know, some people will say, oh, the UN is legitimate, others say, no, they're not legitimate. Some people will say, oh, it's a good deal, others will say, no, it's a crap deal. But the stuff that we can really focus on is we hate fossil fuel corporations with the fucking vengeance. All right, so let's focus on that. And those we can hit around Paris, but not destroy. So Paris will just be one point in this long struggle to bring these corporate climate criminals behind bars. So let's focus on that. Thank you, Tatio. Um, Lucia, maybe you would like to comment on the, on the question with trade unions. Because even when it's difficult in, in Latin America too, we have a recent no, interesting okay. experience. So maybe you can tell about that. And other question that sí. you want to comment. Quería decirles que de verdad yo ya. I wanted to say that um, I saw movements, for example, the uh, environmental justice movement um, was very close, worked very close with the workers' movement because they shared experiences in the class struggle. But uh, there were other things, for example, these promises that were made that uh, a million jobs uh, were going to be created through uh, the carbon industry, for example. And that led uh, a little bit to um, uh, the um, weakening of the class struggle, of the, the worker struggle. We decided uh, to come together to find uh, answers to the uh, threats that we were facing uh, from the um, um, free trade agreements, for example, in all the areas um, when it comes to workers' rights, when it comes to environmental um, aspects, health, education, and so on. And also in the area of uh, the privatization, financialization of uh, nature and uh, commodification. And the disposition of the uh, um, uh, trade unions to work together at regional level and to exchange with other movements, they were ready to uh, leave behind the, the corporate model for example, in support cooperatives, which is nothing natural. And of course, they were also ready to uh, talk about uh, things like Buen Vivir with the indigenous uh, peoples. And they came together, and there were many achievements that came from that. There was a platform called Plada. And and there's a there's an aspect where there's a platform on uh, sustainable development, and even though it's called sustainable development, uh, it uh, deals with many possibilities for uh, conversions. And uh, with the mobilizations in Peru, where we always have uh, to overcome uh, the um, uh, local. 
diversities. So there was a very strong link established between different movements, such as Via Campesina as well. And we mutually uh, recognized ourselves in our uh, struggles, our anti-capitalist uh, struggles. And Sometimes we, sometimes it is uh, we can name all our movements, but we uh, uh, we have to recognize, and we did that in Latin America, that we're all fighting for the same um, things, and basically we are all one. For example, in the area of uh, rights to the right to water or the workers' rights, these are struggles that uh, we all have in common, and we share the goals of our struggles. And with respect to Paris, I think, um, of course, we have to travel to the um, uh, summits in order to just to keep up with things and to know uh, what's going on. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen in Paris, but I know that in the summer university in Attac in, in Paris in August, um, many uh, uh, members and representatives of the different movements uh, were present and attended this, this meeting and they will come to Paris as well. So I think we uh, should build bridges um, between these two uh, parties. Okay, um, two things. Uh, first of all, I'm very interested about the struggle on the Canary Islands. Uh, it will be very interesting to connect fishermen who are resisting big oil. So. I'll, I'll get more information on that so that we can see areas of cooperation with the fishermen who are resisting uh, drilling of oil there. Then about um, the Yasuni case that was mentioned, uh, actually that wasn't the original. What eventually was presented was a government moderated position. What activists in Ecuador wanted was for the oil to be left in the soil, not, because, not for compensation or anything. Because leaving the soil in the oil in the soil is more valuable than bringing the oil out of the ground. But I think the argument the government brought in, which was the Yasuni Pro ITT proposal, actually speaks to the whole logic of carbon offsetting. And all those who applaud carbon offsetting should have been very happy with the Yasuni project. It says, leave the oil in the soil, pay me only half of the value of the oil. Carbon offsetting means keep polluting Europe or North America. Then, then pay for a forest to be preserved in Africa. So if you could pay for crude oil to be left in the soil, then I think that's, that's even a more direct carbon offsetting idea. But because the whole carbon offsetting is a false proposal, uh, the Yasuni project wasn't attractive because all the consuming measures and all the oil companies want the crude oil. So they, they, can, they would not agree to leave oil in the soil except under uh, people's movements and pressure. This is what the Ogoni, Ogoni context is very instructive. As I said earlier, for 21 years, Ogoni people have forced Shell out of their territory. They, by forcing Shell out of the territory, they forced every other oil corporation out of Ogoni territory, and the oil is still in the soil. And I can project that for the next 30 years at least, nobody will touch the oil in Ogoni. By that time, the world will be crazy to still depend on crude oil. Thank you. Um, just to add a few words on, on Yasuni. Um, yeah, besides what Nemo said, now still people are resisting in, the, in, in Ecuador. And, I think what was 
achieved with all this process, even when it was changed, the initial idea was changed by the Ecuadorian government. The initial proposal uh, had in mind people to um, reappropriate themselves from Yasuni, not only the communities living there, but Ecuador, and then the rest of the world understanding how important it is for the, for the Earth. And uh, the matter that many of you have heard about Yasuni until now, it, it brings a point. It's like people really got the point of how important it is to leave the oil in the soil. So going beyond the matter that Germany or England didn't pay what the Ecuadorian government was asking, this is the moment to support and um, we say abrazar, to hug the communities in Ecuador in their defense of the territory and of Yasuni. I think that that is very important from, from this process. Um, yeah. Are there other questions, comments? One, two. Nicola? Okay. W one, two. <laughs> ah, you? <laughs> then one. I passed the but microphone. You have the mic. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you're holding the important tool. <laughs> Uh, Jonathan said I could jump the queue because it's your Sunni, because this momentum of the discussion is so important. I'm Patrick Bond, Durban, South Africa. And I think we have to say uh, those in the global north should pay a climate debt. I'm one. I flew here this morning from Durban. The climate debt needs projects to generate solidarity. I think uh, the comrades here know there's a group called German Watch that did a little film called The Bill. And it makes the case that Germans owe a large climate debt. And one German, Dirk Nebel, was in charge of Yasuni. And just like Nuno said, he didn't want to pay a climate debt. He wanted a carbon trade. And the UNDP was part of that. And that was one of the reasons that the project was sunk. We couldn't, in climate justice uh, politics, support uh, that there would be a carbon offset strategy for Yasuni. However, I do think that there need to be climate debt projects that generate the solidarity of people in Germany, or like me in the global north in Durban, South Africa, to make some solidaristic statement, usually through uh, some conservation project that the, that the mass of the people, Konai or Axion Ecologica, have supported. Yasuni was a great, great project. Nima and I went through there in a canoe. We think it's fantastic. Another is a basic income grant in Ochevera, Namibia, as a pilot of paying people whose lives have been destroyed by desertification, and a model for a fair and just and solidaristic approach that Igi Natal and the Evangeliki Kirche have been supporting. To me, those climate debt projects are very important for us to link the degrowth and the climate justice. And I hope we can keep thinking about Yasuni and what went wrong and whether not a monetization of Yasuni, but a climate debt to make the project more viable to a larger number of people could be restored for the next uh, time we try. Thanks, comrades. Uh, Jonathan Neal, Campaign Against Climate Change in Britain. Um, I want to comment a bit more on the unions, because in Britain, we do have a plan supported by about half the unions for an energy transition. And we say that what we want is one million jobs in renewable energy, in insulating houses, and in public transport. And a few more things, but basically those three things. And that we want within 20 years an end to 90% of gas, oil, and coal and within 30 years, the elimination completely of gas, oil, and coal. This is supported by now by, among other unions, Unite, which is the union of the oil workers, <laughs> the union of the nuclear workers, the union of the power workers. The way that we did, this can be done. England is not a forward country. We are a backward country politically. It can be done, but the <laughs> first important thing to do it 
is to get is we say the condition of this is that everyone who loses their jobs in an old high carbon job in oil or coal or whatever gets a guaranteed job in the new renewable energy economy and that that job is public sector it's a government job and these, the whole of the renewables energy is public sector because if we promise people a job in the private sector, everyone will know we're lying. That lie has been told many times before. So, so it has to be a public sector job. So there is, the, this plan is very popular with the unions, very popular with the environmentalists, but it also requires the environmentalists to be in favor of public sector jobs, not private corporations, and to be in favor of guaranteeing the jobs to these people. The two more things. The way that we did this was not to start with the Union Confederation at the top and not to start with environmentalists separately. We started from our campaign, which was the main climate campaign, and we started with all of our activists who were already trade union members. And then we built from the bottom in the unions. Because if you try and negotiate at the top, you end up with the lowest thing the unions will accept. And the unions of miners and so on, the unions of miners and power workers, those are the last unions you win over, <laughs> not the first. We started with postal workers and railway workers and university teachers, <laughs> people with nothing to lose. <laughs> and then we moved on. The last thing is about, and it's different, is about Paris and what we do in Paris. Um, Tacho's point is very important. We're not saying to everybody, go to Paris, as in go to the summit. We are saying it's very important is what you can do here where you live. And in Britain, one thing we are talking about now a lot, and it is approved by the International Coalition meeting in Paris last month, is to try and have student occupations in the last week of the COP. We're going to try and have it in every university in Britain and have teach-ins with the occupations because that is the kind of direct action that we will need <laughs> <laughs> to stop climate change and to, uh, b before we are through. So anybody who wants to keep in touch with us about student occupations or about the trade unions, find me after the meeting. Thank you. you have a question? Uh, I have a small question <laughs> to Lucia, so I will talk in Spanish. Um, Lucia, you said that entre los movimientos There is a lot of support for projects in Latin America, and I was wondering how they were linked. Are those environmental feminist projects, whether they had a common plan, a common goal that linked, links them, or whether they can just be summarized under one headline? Also feedback. How you see the role of uh, how is the role of uh, the, uh, the degrowth uh, movement or the concept in this idea of uh, providing this um, or uh, looking as commonalities with other movements? And I think a very uh, remar remarkable aspect of degrowth, which is constantly mentioning on uh, by speakers but not always fully understand, is that it is because it is Eurocentric that it is important because degrowth um, as a uh, as Juan Martinez Alia already said, it's uh, uh, first of all an activist slogan that appeared as a reaction to uh, the idea, to the hegemony of economic growth and of the need of expansion and of the idea of development from an Eurocentric perspective. And, and therefore it is very important that we are capable, the movements in Europe, of building a concept, of building an identity around a concept that um, puts in cause uh, it, its own Eurocentric construction since colonial times. Mm -hmm. So we have been constantly in expansion, supporting uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, these territories at the cost of other territories. And by this, of course, there have been struggles emerging in these other uh, southern territories, uh, especially at, uh, at, uh, at the commodity frontiers. Uh, and what, what the, the role of the degrowth movement uh, uh, can have 
by searching these alliances is precisely by um, 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 putting in cause uh, uh, the whole expansion of the economic system in the northern regions, allowing space for these alternatives in the south to emerge, which, I, which is mainly the, uh, the argument that Martinez Alia puts forward. And another thing that I think is very important is the, the identity aspect. So, and, and, I mean, I, I look very much from a perspective of uh, the social metabolism. We will also have a panel tomorrow. And there is, um, in many struggles, uh, we find that uh, uh, ecological values, for example, they come together with, uh, um, uh, fr from a, a perspective of metabolism, which is basically the physical and energetical flows and so on, they come together with what the uh, original peoples, what indigenous peoples, peasants and so on have. So there is a convergence in this sense, and this needs to be recognized. So we are, with the growth, questioning the whole... Uh, uh, this also relates a bit with uh, 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 what was here said about the... the uh, in the conferences, uh, actually, I think the <coughs> climate justice movement started before Copenhagen. There was a, a, a network called Rising Tide, on which I was also involved. It was very marginal. It was basically by... Um, um, autonomous groups uh, that were coming together. Some still exist, for example, Rising Tide in the UK, and there's an important role. But it, it's uh, then in Copenhagen, what happened is the, also other NGOs saw actually this, this led, we went into flexibilization, financialization of nature, and so on. And it was again captured, the whole discourse of climate change, by the traditional model of development that has been practiced by foundations, by NGOs, and so on, from an Eurocentric perspective, trying to export what is the idea of well-being. And we really need to question this, so I think, um, yeah, I leave it. Sorry. For it. There was another question. No more? Up there. One question up there. All comment. Five minutes left. <laughs> About nine minutes There's left on my clock, anyway. Yeah. Enough, yeah, so um, I've never really been an activist, but I was still thinking uh, about strategies and how to kind of link uh, many of these kind of uh, ideas and concepts. So uh, I thought uh, the best kind of leverage point is actually in the, in the south. I mean, um, it's kind of cheaper. So, so why don't we have a way that we can kind of directly sponsor activists in the south like the, the people in the north can kind of directly sponsor uh, more kind of activism in the south so in that way um, we have this kind of uh, debt you know like the climate debt and and even our money system is based on debt and we are actually richer in a way because we have more debt in the north i mean it's pretty crazy but our currency is kind of stronger and we could we could uh, have this kind of system where we sponsor more of these kind of actions in the South and target them at, at uh, individual kind of uh, uh, important points and maybe even have a kind of system online where you would get badges or whatever that you could f post on your social networks. I mean, I think a lot of young people, they would uh, be really into this kind of social currency of like saying, whoa, I sponsored uh, like some kind of Peruvians now who can uh, go to some uh, uh, demonstration against some mining companies, whatever. I mean, that's pretty cool, I think. There's just some, some kind of ideas to kind of link many of these things and the te technologies we have today. Um, and also linking more of these organizations together to, to be stronger because we end up having all these small organizations and kind of small demonstrations, but we need like much more force directed at crucial uh, points. And maybe um, the conferences, I mean, these, the police forces and governments are so strong at those kind of conferences. Maybe we need to kind of think outside the box and, and, and target other, uh, other points. Yeah, this is my, uh, my ideas. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so we have now seven minutes to finish. Uh, two minutes each. Okay. Right. This last one. Two minutes. A. Um, we need to talk much more about climate debt because it is a necessary component 
of a just degrowth strategy, and we all know that it is a necessary component of a climate justice strategy, and we in the North have so far failed in our attempts to make this a sort of broader issue that is politically viable, so, you know, very much, um, you know, it's upon us to work more on this. Um, the second point, actually, to the, you know, comrade who said that this was about sort of, degrowth is a Eurocentric movement, that's where it sort of comes from. I would kind of question whether degrowth is an activist slogan, like food sovereignty is an activist slogan. Degrowth has to be traced through the academic literature and then enters movement debates. But that's not the point. The point is that it is so powerful a frame that there was a major parliamentary inquiry in Germany into questions of growth criticism and questions of well-being. There hasn't been a major parliamentary inquiry into climate justice. If I talk to my grandfather and say, hey, you know what, your growth is connected to other people's climate debt, he doesn't understand. If I say, you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet, he understands. So I think the fact that it's a Eurocentric frame, that its origin is Europe, makes it relevant in Europe. So I didn't say that to diss it, but just to specify what can be done with it and what not, and who kind of what can, we can learn from each other. So in the end, I think we, I can, my summary, 10 seconds from these discussions, there is a lot of potential areas of, 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 of cooperation, and I look forward to that cooperation and to working in the trenches with you guys. <laughs> Solo voy a contestar sobre los I would just uh, briefly talk about how we can articulate this. I think that we created a culture where often we have a concrete campaign or action that is only valid in one context. For example, a struggle against ALCA and then we achieved uh, a success, but then what next? I think we created a culture where we have struggles, where we can recognize ourselves, but also where we have to act. And with Friends of the Earth, we articulate like um, players of uh, climate justice and we try to be different from other NGOs because we have a political proposal that work collaborates with the March of the Women, with Via Campesina, with debt and with the power of uh, the financial market in South America. I think that this convergence with the movements in America is closely linked to Cuba and support for ALBA, for example. I think that our struggle or the menace that we're facing, if there is a menace, is um, responsible for many concrete, actual, real things. Um, and we can also see international problems on a global scale and that uh, we have to collaborate with different players. And uh, of course, there's also there are also some unions in Central America. The growth debate to the direction I would like it to move, and what I would like the activists in that sphere to do is to work to hold the governments in Europe responsible for and get them to pay the climate and ecological debt. Uh, because if that is really done, I think I think uh, the global South is far richer than the global North. Uh, unfortunately, the accounting books have not been kept right, <laughs> but that cannot be allowed to be that permanently. That's an issue that needs to be addressed, because it's a debt that cannot be ignored. If you cannot, if the IMF and the World Bank and the Paris Club cannot write off $10 billion, how, how can we just forget the tons and tons of trillions and zillions of dollars and euros debt that is owed the Global South? That issue 
will have to be addressed, and the, the growth movement can use that as a leverage point to deepen the debate, because if you really need to pay that up, I don't think you'll be talking of limitless growth. That, that would be a real roadblock. So now you have to pay what you owe, and don't just keep pretending you're not owing nothing. Um, I think also that the, the contents of the Universal Declaration for the Rights of Mother Earth really tells, gives a lot of direction on what we, areas that we can, the two movements can cooperate. For example, a campaign against military expenditure. Uh, a fraction of the budget for the military can make a, a lot of changes in the world if you invest in renewable energy or other areas that would drive the world away from dependence on fossil fuels and all other dangerous climate activities. Uh, so, so that is right there. The points that we can document and points that we can all look at together and uh, face a common challenge. Then, finally, I would like to invite all of you to Nigeria next year, November next year. It's a long time that there will be no Ebola by that time. So November <laughs> can come. November next year will be the 20th anniversary of the execution of Ken Sarawiwa. And we want to make it a big event in the climate movement. And you know, you can also make it in the deep growth movement that telling share that if extracted enough, they have to respect life. Thanks everyone for joining the panel. Uh, we feel that the debate is open. We found many convergences some divergences that we need to sort out in the process. Uh, but I think the invitation from Nemo to, to come to Nigeria, to Nigeria, but also to continue struggling against extractivism is now uh, like what we can bring out of this panel. Thank you. Well done. And thank you, thank you to the translators and to the facilitation and the people of the technics and the live stream from the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Thank you.